uh, if we could restart the, the committee. Um, obviously, if you've seen um, Mr Fallon's obviously felt a bit unwell. I think sometimes we forget how stressful it is giving evidence before any committee, particularly with the lights and everything else. So I've obviously asked that uh, he, t he get some air elsewhere. And uh, perhaps in part for you and all of you, I could thank him for his contribution today. Um, I think he made some excellent points. Um, and do any other members have any other general points they, uh, they want to raise in terms of this I think, very useful uh, petition? I think clearly it makes sense to ask the Scottish Government for their views. And as we're talking particularly about local authorities, it probably makes sense to ask a cross-section of local authorities and health boards for their views. And in the usual way, I would probably ask that we ask for five of each and I'll ask the clerk to look at a cross-section of you know, urban, rural and perhaps island authorities for their view on the petition, and we can consider it at a further meeting. Uh, do members have uh, other groups they would like to write to? Uh, Chip Brody? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. But I just went down local authorities. But, uh, if I may, I think we should at least embrace uh, Aberdeen, Glasgow and Edinburgh in yeah, that, yes. to find out exactly what they're doing, and given the, the, the scope and the size um, and uh, yeah, I think actually the petition is a good petition and was well presented. John Wilson. Can you know, if we write to local authorities and understand why they need to write to the four large city authorities, I think it would be useful if we also include Highland and Borders councils to find out what their views on the petition would be, because as I said in my questioning, the, the issue for uh, remote and rural <coughs> authorities may be slightly different from that of the other authorities. Could I also suggest we write to the Scottish Court Service to find out their views on the uh, suggestion that we should include free Wi-Fi in the courts the premises? Yeah, David Torrance. Convener, it might be also interesting to see a partnership working, especially with um, bid areas. And I know in Kirkcaldy, partnership working with the council in the bid areas supply free Wi-Fi for yes. the length of all their buildings and high streets. Yeah, so it might good. be worth writing to some of the bid districts. Yeah, yeah that's a good, a good point. Uh, Jackson Carlo. Um, Convener, I would have said to uh, Mr McFarland, I thought his petition was actually quite timely. Um, and there was one point he made that I would like to see drawn out in the letter that we might send to the Scottish Government. Because what I think has happened in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen has happened uh, in spite of and not because of any initiative from the centre. And therefore the tide of events might mean that it becomes impossible for any authority or organisation not to offer this level of service because it will clearly be behind the eight ball. And I would be quite interested to know what the Scottish Government's perception is of the potential for areas of Scotland to be left behind in the provision of this service, which is a recurring theme, I think, of general internet provision and IT provision over the years, and whether they maybe feel that in the light of developments that are taking place in some of the major cities, there is the need for a light, a light touch coordinating role from the centre which I think might appeal to me more than the kind of slightly more regulatory suggestion emerging out of the petition. But nonetheless, I think that might get to the heart of what is, um, could become a, an ongoing issue for many Scots living in parts of Scotland who might feel that they're not getting the same level of service as a result. The point I was going to ask to get Mr Farland um, was also, the other side of the coin is the sort of infrastructural providers. Presumably, if you're doing this on a larger scale, there's a sort of economies of scale from provision. So is it worth writing to BT and the number of the other providers uh, to see what their view on this would be? I know, obviously, in my patch in Hands and Islands, the, following the BDUK money, that there's a major rollout of, of broadband in, in Highlands and Islands. And, but that came, I mean, that was hundreds of millions of pounds that came from, from a UK grant award. But it would be interesting to see what, not just BT, but some other of the providers as well. Well, I, I, again, I don't know if you're looking at my notes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, have that down, the I, then have, I then have some suspicion as to what might follow if we go to uh, a provider at this stage. Mm -hmm. It might be something that we do later. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to understand what the demand side is first before okay. we start talking about or having uh, companies, which shall remain nameless, rushing mm -hmm. to every local authority yeah. to secure um, provision to every public building. Why don't we just leave it that we, we've chased up the various bodies we talked about and don't touch the providers at this stage then and we can look at that at a later stage. Have we missed anyone? Anyone else we should be writing to? 
No. Okay. Well, thanks for Can I, can I yes, you, you write to Mr. McFarlane. Yes. And uh, commend him on his petition and how. Yep. And uh, hopefully, he, he will be. I'm sure he will be better. And we'll certainly do that. Thanks. That's a good, a good point. Um, so we will obviously continue the petition. We'll write to all the bodies that we've identified. And again, just kind of put in the record our thanks to Mr. McFarlane for coming uh, before us. And I'm sure I follow the committee. We wish him well. I'm sure it was just a, a minor uh, blip that he had, but. We uh, hope he gets home safely and we've made provision for that. I suspend first for two minutes to allow our new witness uh, to join us. Um, if we could uh, restart the committee, our second new petition is PE 1525 by Catherine Fraser on access to justice. Members, I note by the clerk, the spice briefing and the petition. Uh, we have apologies for Mary Scanlon, um, who has met Mrs Fraser, and uh, she spoke to me earlier, uh, Mrs Scanlon spoke to me earlier just to say she's very supportive of this individual uh, petition. Uh, can I welcome the petitioner, Catherine Fraser, to the meeting? Um, also, for the record, um, could I make it clear that I've met Mrs Fraser um, before. She came to see me as one of the regional MSPs for the Highlands and Islands. And before Mrs Fraser speaks, it might be worth stating on the record that the committee cannot become involved, obviously, in individual cases. That's not the rule of the committee. Members are aware that the petitioner was involved in the court action, but the committee consideration must be about the general policy issue and not the specifics of any uh, court case. That just uh, reflects our current standing orders. Um, Mrs. Fisher, if you can perhaps give us uh, a five-minute maximum presentation, and I'll kick off a few questions and ask my colleagues to be involved. Okay. Well, good morning, and I would like to thank the convener and the committee for inviting me here today to talk about my petition, Access to Justice for All. I felt compelled to raise this petition, primarily due to my own personal experience in trying to access justice, and through this, the realisation that there is in fact a major failing in the way the justice system operates, specifically in defamation cases. Under current legislation, defamation cases are excluded from receiving legal aid, other than in very exceptional circumstances. Justice is about fairness and impartiality, and regardless of the nature of the case, justice should be accessible to all. If a case is deemed to be of public interest when it goes through the court process, there must be provision in place for people like myself who try to challenge a decision but are prevented from doing so because legal aid is refused purely on the grounds of the nature of the case. The right of appeal serves very little purpose if it is not accessible to everyone who has gone through the court system. No innocent person should ever be left in a position of being found guilty and wrongfully punished with no means of challenging the decision, whether it be a criminal or civil matter. The validity of every decision should be of equal merit to the justice system, and there should be no discrimination. A person's inability to fund an appeal should never be a barrier in accessing justice as this can only be described as prejudiced and unethical. To have the knowledge that the court decision is wrong is devastating in its own right, but to be unable to challenge this because a person cannot afford to is immoral and makes a total mockery of what the justice system stands for. All cases go through the same justice system, and therefore equal rights should apply when trying to take up the right of appeal. What is the purpose of legal aid? Surely it is to enable people 
who do not otherwise have the financial means to pursue their right to justice. Why should defamation be any different to any other case? History proves that human error occurs in all aspects of the justice system, and it is a model that innocent people are left to stand alone in their fight very often for many years before the truth is eventually heard. How much worse for people who are not even afforded the opportunity to have the judgment of the court scrutinised. Surely a court decision should be reached on logic, not lack, and on evidence, not opinion. To reach a court decision based on the balance of probabilities and the perspective of one sheriff does not guarantee justice. How many members of the public are actually aware of the failings and inadequacies within the system which leaves people open to the very real risk of suffering and injustice? From meetings and conversations with professionals within the legal, justice and law enforcement professions, these failings are acknowledged and it would seem widely accepted as just the way the system operates. Although these people are part of the system, they seem powerless to take any action to make changes to improve the modus operandi. On a personal note, while trying to access justice, the many words of sympathy, along with the standard response of seek legal advice, was of no benefit whatsoever. To be advised by several people within the system that the truth is not always heard in court and that a different sheriff may take a different view of the evidence and reach a different decision is of no consolation to anyone who has suffered an injustice. Words are easy, but unless provision is in place to allow everyone, with no exception, to have access to justice, any words are meaningless. Every taxpayer will have their own views on how their taxes should be spent, what is worthwhile and what is a waste. While my petition was open for signatures, there were some very negative views regarding this. I would challenge any of these people and anyone else who is of the same opinion to continue to hold their current views if they had an injustice inflicted upon them. I am confident they would reconsider and their opinions would change. I too am a taxpayer and believe I, along with others who have suffered injustice, should be afforded the same protection as every citizen of this country. To have a healthy justice system, all aspects of it must be transparent, open to scrutiny and accessible to the people who depend on its integrity. Only then will the public have faith and confidence in the justice system and believe that it is more than just a lottery. For the reasons I have outlined, I would urge the committee to support me in my petition to have the law changed to guarantee access to justice for all. Thank you. Th thank you very much for your uh, submission. Um, in summary then, would, would you agree with me in, uh, in summarising your petition that you feel that ordinary citizens without substantial means are disadvantaged in defending defamation actions, particularly for facing large organisations or wealthy individuals? Yes. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be aware that there was um, a UK test case on this, um, which was successful, as I understand it, under the European Convention of Human Rights. It was Steele and Morris versus the UK, the so-called Mac Libel exactly. case. I mean, as I understand it, that did lead to some changes in legislation. Do you feel that was a helpful move in the right direction? Yes, but probably hasn't gone far enough. I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not a legal person and I don't know all the ins and outs of the law. And really, I can only talk you know, from what I experienced. And the, the bottom line is that I could go nowhere because there was nowhere open to me hmm. because I couldn't get legal aid Indeed. and I couldn't afford, you know, to fund hmm. and appeal myself. I suppose, I mean, I can understand the issue around not getting legal aid, therefore you can't get access to justice. But the other point I sort of picked up on... Uh, conversations we had earlier was that you felt there was a lack of um, expertise in this area and you really needed to go to some of our larger cities to get lawyers who specialised in that area. Would that be fair comment? Yeah, I mean, again, from my own personal experience, there was absolutely nobody in Inverness who, you know, was 
willing to even touch uh, the case or look at it. And um, I at least, the people who did look at it, you know, could see where I was coming from. But again, you know, there was nothing they could do because that's just the way the system is. You and know, obviously, that's... I'm aware of my earlier early comments mm. just to talk about the wider situation in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. So then there may be some issues around provision of justice in, in rural areas, perhaps, that, that we need to have a look at as well in this committee. Well, for me, I mean, I just feel, like I've said in my petition, that every person should have equal rights, you know, regardless where, where you are or, you know, what the case is about. I, I believe that everybody should have the same right in challenging a court decision. And I, and I just believe that, you know, the means should be there to do that. Finance should never be a barrier to challenging a court decision. Thank you for that. And I bring my colleagues in. Um, any colleagues? Uh, 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 just uh, a couple of brief points from our, our briefing. It's not the case, is it? that um, legal aid is not available for cases of, uh, limited cases of defamation, mm -hmm. or indeed in counterclaims of def defamation. So how would you determine, I know you said it's a broad sweep, but clearly uh, that then opens the door for what might be bona fide, certainly in some bona fide cases, but some not so bona fide claims of defamation. How would you or would you differentiate between the different elements of defamation? Um, well, no. I, I mean, again, I think, you know, everybody has the right. And if a person knows that they have been judged wrongly and there's nothing that they can do about it, I mean, how can anybody justify that? How can the justice system say, well, that's right, you know, it's okay for the odd one or two to slip through the net, basically? Um, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but there has to be some determination, because um, we know that there is a broad sweep well, when you apply I, defamation in terms of costs, uh, relevance, uh, and so on. So do you not agree that there has to be some determination as to what is a bona fide a counterclaim or indeed uh, a bona fide claim under terms of the um, Legal Aid Act of 2007? Well, I'm not, I'm not <coughs> a legal person, so <laughs> some of the things you're saying. But as far as I, for myself, I believe that I have been defamed because the judgment against me is on public record it is on the internet for anybody to read. And if there was any way that I could counterclaim against that, I would. I know, because, we, we, know, can't, we, can't go into, I know sorry, we can't go into your specific yeah, case, mm -hmm. but we all have different frames of reference when it comes to looking at uh, what is defamatory statements mm -hmm. or not. Yeah. Uh, and some of them might be you know, defamatory, in defamatory in my eyes, but might be true in somebody else's eyes. So do you not agree that, that that's part of the issue, is, is rather than have a, you know, a sweep up everything, that there are cases that well, border think, on not being defamatory. I think that is where the, the court, you know, that's part of the whole process of going through the court to try and get to the truth of the matter and what is defamation and what isn't defamation. But if the wrong decision is reached, then there should be provision there for anybody to challenge the court decision. It's just like it's, the door is closed. No, and why that. should uh, defamation uh, be any different to yeah. any other case? Well, one, one question, when you throw, the door might be closed to some, but if you throw the door open, mm -hmm. then we, we might be considering cases that uh, don't meet the criteria that you're looking for. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. I think perhaps for... Clarity, and I think this is the point that you're effectively saying, is that there, there is some funding available in civil legal aid for advice and assistance 
but that doesn't extend to representation in the court mm -hmm. unless there's some much wider, wide, wider arching issues. I think, I think that's the issue you're getting at, mm -hmm. Mrs. Fraser. Right. Can I ask for further questions and points from, from members? Um, right, but the point we're at now then is to um, at the summation point where we decide uh, what the next step is. So we've reached the end of the, the door for questions and, and points. Um, so it does seem, I think, sensible for us to uh, ask the Scottish Government, the Scottish Legal, Legal Aid Board, the Lost Type Scotland, and perhaps the Scottish Human Rights Commission for views on this particular petition. But first of all, ask if the committee are agreeable with that course of uh, events, and secondly, whether there's other people we should be writing to. Chair Brody. No, I, I mean, I, I, in general, I agree. I think I'd, I'd seek, if I could, further clarification of the ECHR um, commentary, particularly the, the, I mean, we had the situation in, in, the, in the case that you've mentioned, convener, but um, I'm not too sure that that is being or may be interpreted correctly. Well, I think the, my understanding, I think it was in the spice briefing, is that following the uh, sort of test case of Steele and Morris, uh, it led to uh, further legislation in Scotland, was my understanding, from the spice briefing. But we can certainly get further clarity from spice. Amit Taggart? Just to agree on um, the action that you have mentioned. John Wilson. Could I suggest, when writing to the Scottish Government, could we seek clarification on what the term exceptional circumstances apply in relation to defending the situation that Ms Fraser brought to us today? Because clearly, in the spice briefing, if we go back to the spice briefing, there is a reference made to the, I think it was then Justice Minister in Parliament in 2007, made a statement that uh, funding would be made available in exceptional circumstances. And I think that took on board the situation that you mentioned in terms of the legal case around the McLibel uh, situation. But clearly it would be useful to find out for a clear definition of what exceptional circumstances would be because Ms Fraser's outlined circumstances where she's found herself, and I know there are others who find themselves in similar circumstances where they feel the judicial system uh, and justice is not served because they cannot afford yeah. to challenge uh, decisions because the Legal Aid Board has taken a decision not to fund the actions. So it would be useful just to get a, a clarification uh, and quite clearly and also possibly ask how many exceptional circumstances have there been since the legislation in 2007 was enacted. Not for the first time Mr Wilson's predicted my uh, re recommendation. I think we need to look at the actual numbers. But the main point I would emphasise, the point I made earlier, is that there is some funding for advice and assistance. But advice and assistance is not much use to you if you're not, if you're not able to have representation in court. Um, it's very, very difficult in a civil or a criminal case to represent yourself. And the old cliche is, you know, if you represent yourself, you've got a fool for a client, is, is a very key one. It's very, very difficult to represent yourself irrespective of how good the advice and assistance you've been given in advance is. Uh, Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Vina. I was actually going to make a similar point to John Wilson because I, I do think that if we simply write to the various bodies that we are suggesting um, on the most general principle underpinning the petition, then the response we're going to get is that there are no plans to change it because it would open the floodgates and it would be unsupportable. So I think it would therefore be interesting in writing to them uh, to follow the point that John Wilson has done, but also to ask what discussions or consultations there have been, meaningful consultations or discussions there have been about the potential expansion of the criteria that would allow for a degree of additional support to be offered in circumstances where I think there would be in the sense that we've understood the evidence this morning, likely cases we would wish to have seen supported as opposed to those that could end up simply uh, tying the courts down in unnecessary time and, in fact, proving an obstacle to other justice being progressed. Yeah. That's a good point. Are committee members agreeable we take that course of action? Any further points that we've missed that committee members wish to wish to raise? Well, th thank you for that. And well, can I thank Catherine Fraser for coming along and providing um, evidence for us. As you can see, we've taken this petition forward. Uh, we will write to these various bodies, we'll get the information back and the clerks will keep you in touch 
uh, with ongoing uh, developments on the petition. And could I thank you again for travelling through today and taking the time to come and give us uh, your evidence and answering the questions. Uh, I'll suspend for two minutes to allow our witness uh, to leave. Thank you. If we could uh, resume our um, committee. Um, the, with the committee's uh, agreement, could I uh, defer for a few minutes the PE1098 and PE1223? It's just that Stuart Stevenson was hoping to come. As you know, Stuart Stevenson has been very strongly supporting this petition and has a lot of expertise in this area. Obviously, if he doesn't come within a reasonable time, because I'm aware we've got the petitioner here, I don't want to delay uh, him as well. Uh, so perhaps if we could give it half an hour and I'll take the other petitions. Would yep. that be agreeable? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Uh, the next petition is PE 1506 by Alison C. Tate on behalf of the Robert Burns World Federation Limited on renaming Glasgow Presco Airport to Robert Burns International Airport. Yes, Members yeah. have a note by the clerk and a submission from uh, petitioners. Um, could I, uh, I think, particularly like uh, ask Chip Brodie to speak on this because I know Mr Brodie's taken a very keen interest. I know other members have as well, but uh, I will start with Mr Brodie. Thank you, Convener. I think <coughs> I've taken more than a keen interest. I made my position very clear. Um, while I understand the uh, position of, the, of the, the Cabinet Secretary regarding the name in the short term, we've now had a situation which was predicted by some, me being one, that Glasgow Airport, uh, Aberdeen Airport and Southampton Airport would be up for sale, uh, largely because of Heathrow Holdings investment, they hope, in the next uh, runway. That provides a, a dilemma because what I would not wish, and I'm sure those that support this would not wish to happen, is that we get confused uh, with what's going on in, in Glasgow. The rationale behind Glasgow Prestwick Airport, and I said I would you'd never use that uh, again some months ago, but Glasgow Prestwick Airport was largely because of the airline or the major airline that used uh, Presswick Airport uh, and its belief that the attendant name of Glasgow would attract more and more passengers, just as has happened in Frankfurt, Sweden, France, etc. So my view, my, my view is quite clear and I've made it very clear. This airport will be called at some stage Robert Burns International Airport. It seems inequitable that we have a situation where Belfast, and I was over there just three weeks ago, uh, has its airport named after, a city airport named after George Best. We have John Lennon, we have Charles de Gaulle, and yet we, here we have the icon of, uh, of, of Scottish culture, known, whose words are translated into 195 uh, languages across uh, the globe. Um, so, while I understand the co continuity, while well, the, 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 the airport is going through some change, and I have to say uh, there are some exciting things uh, happening. Um, uh, I, but I do believe, uh, and I will do everything I can and personally make sure that this petition that comes to fruition and that ultimately that airport, that successful airport, will be named Robert Burns International. Thank you. I think, Jason Carroll, you've got an interest in as well. <laughs> I've tried to... Get to yes, convener. Um, I listened to what Mr Brodie says with interest. At the end of the day, however, um, two things have happened since we first considered the, last considered the petition. Uh, the first is that there have been further commercial announcements regarding the, uh, in the uh, actual operation of the airport, which have been hugely detrimental to the likely success of the business plan that we are hoping will yet manage to secure the future of this airport. 
with the removal of a very significant level of uh, passenger traffic. And there are different views about the way in which this airport should proceed, with many feeling that its most likely successful route is as a freight hub rather than a passenger transport hub, um, and that in partnership with Glasgow, there could be a successful future for it in that light. But the second thing that's happened is that the management committee charged with the responsibility of securing the future of this airport has considered the very nature of the petition and concluded that that would not be in the best interests of uh, any plan to secure the future of the airport, a decision which obviously has been endorsed by the Cabinet Secretary, uh, the Deputy First Minister, not someone I would normally agree with, but I understand and suppose that she has taken all these in, uh, the, this information into account together with those people who've been charged with the responsibility for taking this forward and has concluded that that's not the way to go. Uh, in which case, I, I feel we should close the petition. Okay, uh, Mr Brody, I think you wanted to... Well, it, it's just, uh, just on the point that we made, I think those of us that have been perhaps a bit closer than, than Mr Carlo to what was going on would understand why Glasgow, uh, Glasgow Airport required to uh, increase its attractiveness by increasing its revenue. Uh, and... Um, while I agree that you know, the key elements of um, maintenance, repair, overhaul, uh, uh, maintenance in, uh, at Presswick is very important, uh, it kind of escaped his notice, not just the other two items that, uh, the two items that he mentioned, but the Presswick has now been nominated as one of the potential six spaceports. Uh, and we have to look, that, you know, look forward as to what, what's likely to happen. So while I understand in the short term, the need for continuity with the attraction, and there are interests already being shown, uh, both in terms of the freight, uh, the uh, repair and overhaul facility, and indeed passenger uh, at, uh, at Presswick. Uh, I think that um, uh, yeah, I would wish that we would keep the petition open and monitor this on a regular yeah. basis. Well, convener, yeah. but the slogan burns in space doesn't really altogether <laughs> sit comfortably with me as a metaphor. Well, on the basis of what's already been carried there, I'm not surprised. Yeah, I, I'm reluctant to intrude in family grief, but I think uh, <laughs> it might be useful for perhaps other members of the committee to get involved. Um, could I perhaps ask Mr Wilson your suggestions for ways forward? Okay, you've been very diplomatic today. Um, yes, I'm... On that note, just a since you're saying I've been very diplomatic today, as I always try to be, uh, particularly with yourself, convener, uh, the, the issue, I think Chick Brodie is in many respects right, that what we might have got from the Cabinet Secretary is a decision that was didn't fully consider the views and aspirations of the, particularly the people of Ayrshire, but also the people of Scotland, because after all, this committee today is meeting in a committee room named after Robert Burns. Yeah. Uh, we took a decision as a parliament to name the committee rooms, and number one on that list was Robert Burns. And this is why we now meet in committee room one, is now known as the Robert Burns committee room. So there, there are views out there that actually support uh, the move to name uh, the airport after Robert Burns because of its location, because of the, the, the world... Uh, renowned reputation that Robert Burns not only has as a poet, but also the, the views that he actually uh, expresses about Scotland and the views that are ex expected all over the world. So it is a well-known name. Other airports and other locations have decided to name their airports after famous sons or daughters of those areas. And I think we should write to the Cabinet Secretary once again uh, to ask whether or not there would be a possibility of her to reconsider the decision uh, and to enter into dialogue and seek views of others, uh, not just commercial views, but the views of the people in, uh, in and around Prestwick and Scotland to find out whether or not it would suit the best commercial sense for that airport to be renamed after one of Scotland's most famous sons. Can I just bring us, and I'll bring, I will bring you in, Mr Carroll. Um, uh, could I ask uh, David Torrance what your view is in John Wilson's suggestion? Um, I'm happy to go along with that and keep the petition open as well. Okay. Um, Amit Taggart. 
Thanks, Convener. Um, I'm not right sure. We could write to the Cabinet Secretary, the, the Deputy First Minister, sorry. However, we have done that and she has gave her decision, so I'm not really sure on what's going to overturn that decision um, for her in particular. Thank you for that. Uh, Angus MacDonald. <coughs> yeah, um, thanks, Kevin. I mean, I certainly take note of um, the um, Deputy First Minister's comments uh, at the um, Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee um, in June. Uh, where she sta stated that um, it was concluded that there are strong commercial reasons to retain the Glasgow Prestwick Airport name uh, rather than to rename it the airport. However, uh, rather than to, to rename the airport. So, um, taking that on board, um, you could perhaps argue that, uh, that, that there is a slight argument to, to, to contact the Cabinet Secretary once more. Um, to have a, to see if it would be possible to, while retaining the Glasgow Presswick name, um, have a sub name, <laughs> if, if, if possible. You know, I mean, anything's worth a try. Well, I think we have the majority of that, but I'm, I'll bring in um, for one more time Mr. Carlo and Mr. Brodie. But I said I, I really don't want to have a huge debate on this. But M Mr. Carlo, I just want to make the point that it is the commercial future of this airport that has got to be the thing that is secured. The Cabinet Secretary together with those people charged with the responsibility of securing the commercial future of this airport, have concluded that changing the name would not help. And whilst it is true other airports have changed their names, they have usually been successful commercial airports who, in tribute to somebody, have subsequently changed the name. They did not change the name to JFK in New York because it was a failing airport. They did not change the name of Charles de Gaulle in Paris because it was a failing airport. The name change took place in tribute to the individual concerned, not to secure the commercial future of the airport. And it, I think it is wrong for us, where those charged with responsibility have concluded that the commercial future of this airport is best secured by retaining its name, argue to the contrary. Thank you for that. I, I th can I allow, allow Mr. Brody in very briefly? But I said I really don't want to have a huge debate on this. I think we could spend a number of hours debating airports across the world that we know. So, and Mr. I will be very brief. Right. I, I mean, one of the disappointments of Presswick in the past has been the lack of marketing uh, and, and the selling of its capabilities, which are, which, which are quite considerable. Uh, and the branding is, is very important. Of course, Mr. Carl will, be, and I don't disavow that the Cabinet Secretary, the Deputy First Minister, took a decision. Uh, on the basis of short-term uh, continuity of commercial needs. It does seem paradoxical, however, that the theme of the airport is going to be based on burns. Okay. Uh, thank members uh, for that. I think that was quite a very interesting argument. Clearly, there's different views on this, but nevertheless, there's a majority um, suggesting that the petition be continued and we write to the Deputy First Minister on the terms outlined by John, John Wilson. If I can go back to our previous petition, uh, agenda item 2, which is PE1098 by Lynn Merrifield on behalf of King's Seat Community Council and PE1223 by Ron BT on school bus safety. Uh, members of a note by the clerk and submissions. Could I welcome Stuart Stevenson to the meeting, who is a long-standing constituency interest in Mr Beatty's petition, and also um, welcome Mr Beatty, not least for his very great help earlier, an earlier petition that we had, and could again thank Mr Beatty for his dedication and commitment in relation to this petition. I think he's a great example to other petitioners of just having a, a solid view of continuing petition over a number of years. So thank you very much, Mr. Beat, for that. Um, Mr. Stevenson, can I ask if you could give us a very brief summary of the issues? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And I think you are perfectly correct to refer to this as a long-standing issue. It, in fact, was submitted to the committee 2,037 days ago. Uh, there have been 24 discussions so far in the committee. Uh, 55 occasions on which correspondence has been received with the committee. And on the 26th of October, uh, when I, then a minister responsible for the subject, appeared in front of the committee, uh, we ended up with 16 pages uh, in the official report. And I'm just going to very briefly quote from a couple of things um, that, uh, that came from, uh, fr from that. It, we, we had discussion, and I, as minister at that point, made reference to the development of a toolkit, uh, which I think uh, has taken a little longer uh, than we might hope. But perhaps 
One of the people who appeared in front of the committee on that date was Chief Constable uh, Giannassi of uh, South Wales uh, Constabulary. Uh, he made the point in relation to uh, the signage on school buses um, that the legislation is fairly broad and permissive. Uh, local authorities could go much further in specifying what signage they'd like to see in vehicles. And of course, the UK Transport Minister, Mike Penning, was there. Uh, and Chief Constable referred to what he said, said the legislation about minimum signing and local authorities could go much further. Now, there's a great deal more could be said on the subject. But the bottom line is that I think uh, the heart of the subject is protecting our youngsters in their transit to, to schools. Um, I think we've established beyond doubt, and we've heard it from the UK Minister, we've heard it from Chief Constables in south of the border, uh, Chief Constables north of the border, and both from uh, the current Transport Minister, myself, and my time as Transport Minister, there is no legislative barrier to more being done to make signage uh, on school buses uh, more distinct and offer more protection uh, to, uh, to children. And I think we've simply got to stay on this case, find a method by which we can uh, make it a duty, if not necessarily a legal requirement, uh, on all our local authorities to do more. We have examples, and I've been speaking to Mr. Beattie earlier this morning, where there are school buses that do not even carry the school bus sign on them. And I think that's something that will be recognised around the table. So I think we have to get a change of culture we don't have to spend large amounts of money. And in the present climate, a policy that's going to deliver improved safety for our youngsters without spending large amounts of money is a policy that should be adopted without further delay. 2,037 days since this petition was tabled. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. That's very helpful. Obviously, there is uh, three courses of action outlined, but before I look at that, I can ask if any committee member wishes to raise any specific points or have any uh, view on other courses of action we should take forward. Mr. Brody? Well, just very briefly, I, I mean, I, I've made my views known about the, this is probably taking longer than gestation of an elephant. Um, and I defer to you know, the, the superior knowledge of Mr. Stevenson uh, and I uh, thank him for the clarity with which he, uh, he presented the case for this continuing and for us being on the case. Thank you for that. Any uh, other member? Jackson Carlow. Uh, simply to say, convener, I was encouraged by the letter we received from uh, Keith Brown, the Minister, in the sense that the principal point around which we seem to have made no progress with this petition, namely the agreement between the uh, Scottish Westminster Parliaments has now been resolved and the process can effectively begin to allow the legislative uh, devolution competence to transfer to this place and for that and the other actions that are associated to proceed. So I think you know, persistence has eventually resulted in our being able to make progress with the aims of the petition. I think we should be pleased that that is the case. Thank you for that. Do other members wish to contribute? Um, are members then happy with the courses of action um, which are outlined, which are, and I'll just summarise very briefly, in relation to PE 1098, um, we'll continue to monitor the progress of the devolution of powers relating to seatbelt provision and write again to Minister of Transport and Veterans to seek confirmation that progress has been made in line with the timetable set out in the previous response, and Jackson Carroll touched on that. In relation to PE 1223, uh, to write to Causeland Association of Transport Coordinate Officers uh, to seek their views on the difficulty in identifying a local authority to take on the pilot scheme outlined in Transport Scotland's most recent response. And finally, in relation to the same petition, the committee wished to write to the Welsh Government to seek its views on the specific issues of signage and lighting on school transport and what actions taken in this area. Yeah. Is that, are all members agreeable? Yeah. Right. And um, so, again, can I thank Mr. Simpson for coming along again? and he's now an honourable member of this committee, uh, or, or, or perhaps an honorary member of the committee. And uh, I thank Mr Beattie again for uh, his work. Um, and uh, I think it's been a, an excellent, although it's, Mr Stevenson is quite right to say this has gone for a long time. Uh, I don't think it was about speed, it was about direction, Mr Stevenson. So I think we're in the right direction. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, I think Mr Beattie is an example to us all 
and to all petitioners. And I wish him every success. I'm sure he will not leave the case until he's delivered for the people uh, who have uh, led him to this particular cause. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you both very much indeed. Uh, if I can move on to our next uh, petition, it's PE 1509 by Lee Wright on Aberdeen to Inverness Rail uh, Travel Improvement. Uh, members of a note by the clerk, despite a briefing uh, on compulsory uh, seat reservations and standing in trains and uh, the submission. Um, I've got a couple of points before I do that. Just ask if members have any general points that they wish to, uh, to raise at this stage about that particular submission. I think it was a particularly interesting one about, you know, a, a ticket gives you a a right to travel but not necessarily a seat uh, with the exception of, of Eurostar and clearly in high speed trains you wouldn't want uh, people to have to stand for any particular distance they seem not, the regulator doesn't seem to be that concerned about health and safety issues but I thought it was quite an interesting um, argument they were, they were making um, do members have any specific points they wish to raise uh, perhaps I could just ask um, whilst I understand that there's probably some pressure to um, uh, to close the petition, and I do accept that there has been an improvement plan put forward, which I certainly welcome. I had a couple of specific points. Um, the, the first one um, relates to the lack of redoubling of the Inverness uh, end. I mean, much of the problem we've got on that line is it's effectively, if you lose the road equivalent, it's a single track road. That's the, that's the main problem. So, for example, uh, one train is currently scheduled to wait for 13 minutes at Nurn because it's single track. So clearly there's issues of doubling up the line. And there's a similar argument for the train, the train south. I would just like, um, perhaps if we could just clarify that point uh, with the uh, Transport Minister. And also the lack of paths for freight is running. And clearly there's a climate change issue. If we can get freight off the road and onto rail, uh, that really helps achieve our, some of our climate change targets. I'll give a bit more detail to the clerk, but would members be agreeable if, I could, if we could do a note with a view to perhaps closing this at a later period. Is that agreeable? Thank you, thank you for that. Um, if I move to the next petition, is PE 1513 by Ron Park on equal rights for unmarried fathers. Members have a note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, the, obviously, there's a number of options which are outlined in, in the uh, suggestions from the clerk. I mean, the key thing I would uh, put forward, and members will know, um, I did have a social work background in my earlier life, is I would agree with some of the submissions we've got in that clearly the key element of Scots law is that the best interests of uh, uh, children are the key focus that we should be uh, fo focusing on. And the other factual thing that I picked up in the submissions was that the, the, last, the vast majority of fathers in Scotland do have parental rights and responsibilities, which I think is quite important just to specify. And there was some view that we should avoid some sort of parent-centred approach in our submissions, and it's got to be child-centred. So I think that's just picking up some key points um, on the submissions. But could I throw them to yeah. questions and points from uh, committee members? Chip Brody? Yeah, uh, and, and that's absolutely right in terms of uh, we have to consider the, uh, the, the, the children involved. But my concern was uh, it says it shouldn't be parent-centric, and yet when I look at some of the evidence, you know, the father's rights are... Uh, certainly less than those of the uh, of the mother. And I know that uh, somebody made a point that it takes two to, to provide conception, but only one to deliver. That that uh, is, as we know, true. But in terms of of looking at a child, doesn't stay as newly born uh, forever. I mean, it grows, and as there will be requirements to ensure that that. Um, a child's rights are protected. And part of that protection is, I would submit, having uh, the relationship with the uh, other parent, in this case, uh, the father. So uh, I do, in looking at um, Professor, what her name is? Sutherland. Elaine Sutherland's yeah. report, that, that uh, her request to empower the court to order DNA testing of the child so that the the registering of the father, should the father so wish, uh, should be uh, applied in terms of the article that, that uh, she has written. Um, and I think on that basis, it does protect the interests of the child ongoing if uh, the registration, I know that in some cases, you know, that, that uh, have been mentioned again uh, here, rape, etc., um, that, of course, is negated. But uh, by and large, if you look at 97%, 97% uh, of, of, of uh, 
fathers are registered. I don't see why uh, that we assume that the other 3% are all subject to cases of domestic abuse or violence has been mm. caused here. Yeah, I do think that right should be protected, uh, and I support uh, Professor Sutherland's uh, views, indeed, her article, which I find, mm. I find most constructive. Thank you for that. Um, ask, uh, Jackson Carlo. Um, there are, I think, a lot of sensitivities as well as practicalities associated with this petition, and there are a number of recommended actions which I see to us. But I would, on this occasion, given the sensitivity of the subject and also um, that of the petitioner himself, I would, on this occasion, like to write to the Minister asking whether, in hindsight, they potentially regret conflagrating uh, those children who are born as a result of rape with those children who are born as a result of a brief but consensual relationship. I think the petitioner was entitled to feel a certain injustice from that conflagration of those two uh, categories, uh, and I think it was unwise and actually unhelpful. Thank, thank you for that. Do other members wish to contribute? Uh, are members then happy with uh, the suggestions on uh, writing to the Scottish Government? I think there's four points uh, there which I can summarise if you wish, and the additional point with Jackson Carlow. Um, so, uh, just for the record, to summarise that we are continuing this petition and we're seeking the Scottish Government's views on, first of all, the point that Jackson Carlow raised, and the other four points are um, fathers, uh, Families Need Fathers Scotland's proposal that mothers should provide a reason when registering a birth without providing the father's name, that the Law Society Scotland proposal that courts be given the power to order DNA tests when seeking to determine paternity, and the clan child law suggestion that the question of whether all fathers should automatically have parental rights and responsibilities be referred to the Scottish Law Commission for consideration of inclusion in the future programme. And finally, why it considers that the, that the prospect of a mother raising uh, proceedings to remove parental rights and responsibilities from one from which she has had a brief consensual relationship would be unfair. Is that agreed that we uh, action this petition this way? Right, thank you for that. Um, we'll just move on to our next petition. It's PE 1514 by Norman Boney on making time for reflection uh, representative of all beliefs. Members are note by the clerk and the submissions. Um, obviously, I invite uh, suggestions from members, but there's a potential course of action, which is that Standing Orders also provides that the committee may refer the petition to any body to take any action it considers appropriate. Um, I would recommend that the committee may uh, wish to refer this petition and submissions to the Parliamentary Bureau to take account of its review. If such referrals made, the committee should close the petition, but in doing so, should know that any individual or group is able to contact their own MSP or the presiding officer directly with suggestions as who may be invited to lead time for reflection. Are members agreeable with that course of action? Agreed. Right, thank you for that. Um, the next petition is PE1516 by Malcolm Lamont on referenda for Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. Uh, members have a note by the clerk and the submission um, could invite contributions from members. There is a potential option set out, um, which is the committee may wish to defer any further action until the result of the referendum and independence is known. Can I ask the views of the committee on that course of action? Are members agreeable that we do? Uh, yeah, I, I, I also think that, that, we, should, sorry, big pun, uh, that we take recognition of the submission from the Scottish Government, yeah. which indicates a whole raft of, of um, proposed changes. So um, I think we should. <laughs> Wait and see what happens. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Carlo? Uh, I'm prepared to go along with that. I'm not altogether clear in my own mind as an issue of principle whether the outcome of the referendum on September the 18th is, is relevant. Uh, the issue of principle is whether we believe the Scottish Government should be funding additional referenda uh, for the islands. Um, I imagine, irrespective of the outcome of the referendum before us, uh, and I'm not altogether clear that the case for that has been made, I have to say, uh, and uh, I would otherwise have been inclined to uh, close the petition. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the government's made it clear, you know, as Mr. Brody has said, the government's made it quite clear what its position is, and it doesn't support the, the petition and outlines, I think, a lot of work that's been done with Our Islands, Our Future. Um, which I think is a very positive agenda, which has a lot of cross-party support. Um, so we have a number of options. We have two options, really. We can defer this till after uh, the referendum, 
um, or we can take uh, Mr Carlaw's uh, point and we can close the petition uh, here and now. So can I get views from the committee on which I, option? I, I mean, I agree on the basis of what's already been done. We should we close the petition. Uh, Mr Wilson? Uh, Mr Tords? Uh, I would much prefer that it was left open until after the yes, referendum. Uh, Mr McDonald? Um, I would be content to close the petition and um, could, could I also add that it, it's possibly unfortunate that the petitioner didn't consider bringing this forward when the Edinburgh Agreement was being negotiated. Um, I think uh, it's rather late in the day now to, uh, to even be uh, discussing this. Thank you. Uh, by, by majority, then, the committee wishes this petition to be closed, and that's the decision of the committee. The final current today is PE 1522 by Simon Brogan, improving bulk fuel uh, storage safety. Uh, members of a note by the clerk and submissions. Um, I think we had a very good submission from uh, Mr Brogan at a previous meeting. I think I'd, I'd mentioned then that I'd actually met him wearing my uh, regional hat, and I certainly know from discussions I had in Orkney just last week when this was raised um, uh, directly to me. And I think there is uh, quite a lot of issues um, across island authorities about, about safety. It's quite complicated issues about who is responsible. But I do note that the Scottish Government uh, is looking to review uh, the work in this area, which I certainly support. Uh, and I would certainly suggest that uh, we give all the information that we've got in relation to this petition um, uh, to the Scottish Government and then we, we'll look at this uh, again in, in the future. Are members agreeable? Good. Thank, Thank you very much for that. Um, I think that, that's the end of our, our meeting, so can I uh, formally uh, close the meeting? And just uh, if members could stay behind us very briefly, I'll allow uh, members of the gallery to leave.